It is, I confess, with considerable diffidence that I approach the strange narrative which I am about to relate. The events which I propose detailing are of so extraordinary a character that I am quite prepared to meet with an unusual amount of incredulity and scorn. I accept all such beforehand. I live at number 52A 26th Street in New York. The house is, in some respects, a curious one. It has enjoyed for the last two years the reputation of being haunted. My landlady had rented it, and we all moved in rather anticipating the unnatural noises, the opening doors, and fleet-footed furniture which had been sworn to by previous renters. After a month of psychological excitement, it was with the utmost dissatisfaction that we were forced to acknowledge that nothing in the remotest degree approaching the supernatural had manifested itself. Things were in this state when an accident took place so awful and inexplicable in its character that my reason fairly reels at the bare memory of the occurrence. It was the 10th of July. After dinner was over, I went with my friend Dr. Hammond to the garden to smoke my evening pipe. We lit our large meerschaums filled with fine Turkish tobacco, in the core of which burned a little black nut of opium. But our conversation was so morbid and concerned such dismal things that I brought it to a conclusion and went to bed. The room was practically in total darkness, but sleep touched not my bed, for over and over in my mind I had turned the grotesque talk we had just completed. And while I was lying, still as a corpse, an awful incident occurred. Something dropped, as it seemed, from the ceiling plumb upon my chest, and the next instant I felt two bony hands encircling my throat, endeavoring to choke me. The suddenness of the attack, instead of stunning me, strung every nerve to its highest tension. In an instant, I wound my arms around the creature and squeezed it with all the strength of despair against my chest. In a few seconds, the bony hands that had fastened on my throat loosened their hold, and I was free to breathe once more. And then... Then commenced a struggle of awful intensity, immersed in the most profound darkness, totally ignorant of the nature of the thing by which I was so suddenly attacked, finding my grasp slipping every moment by reason, it seemed to me, of the entire nakedness of my assailant, bitten with sharp teeth in the shoulder, neck and chest, having every moment to protect my throat against a pair of sinewy, agile hands which my utmost efforts could not confine. At last, after a silent, deadly, exhausting struggle, I got my assailant under by a series of incredible efforts of strength. Strength. Once pinned with my knee in what I made out to be its chest, I knew that I was the victor. I rested for a moment to breathe. I heard the creature beneath me panting in the darkness and felt the violent throbbing of a heart. It was apparently as exhausted as I was. That was one comfort. With a large handkerchief I had placed under my pillow, I tied the creature's arms, and then, never loosing my hold for an instant, I slipped from the bed to the floor, dragging my captive with me. Quickly as possible, I turned up the gas full and turned to look at my captive. I, I, I cannot even attempt to give any definition of my sensation the instant after I turned on the gas. I suppose I must have shrieked with terror, for on less than a minute afterward, my room was crowded with inmates of the house. I shudder now as I think of that awful moment. I saw nothing. Yes, I had one arm firmly clasped around a breathing, panting, corporeal shape, my other hand gripped with all its strength a throat as warm, as apparently fleshy as my own, and yet I absolutely beheld nothing, not even an outline, a vapor. Just then Dr. Hammond entered my room at the head of the household saying, Great heaven, Harry, what's happened? And I said, Hammond, I've been attacked by something or other which I have hold of, but I can't see it, I can't see it. Harry... What's the matter with you? I swear this is no vision, Hammond. Don't you see how it shakes my whole body with its struggles? If you don't believe me, convince yourself. Feel it. Touch it. Hammond advanced and laid his hand in the spot I indicated. A wild cry of horror burst from him. He had felt it. In a moment, he had discovered somewhere in my room a long piece of cord and was the next instant winding it and knotting it about the body of the unseen being that I clasped in my arms. I was utterly exhausted, and I gladly loosed my hold. There was Hammond twisting the cord tightly around a vacant space. I never saw a man look so thoroughly stricken with awe. We picked up the thing and put it on the bed. The timbers of the bed creaked. A deep impression marked itself distinctly on the pillow and on the bed itself. We remained silent for some time, listening to the low, irregular breathing of the creature and watching the rustle of the bedclothes as it impotently struggled to free itself from confinement. The rest of the household had left the room. Dr. Hammond spoke. Harry... This is awful. I, Awful, but not unaccountable. What do you mean? Let's uh, reason a little, Harry. Here is a solid body which we touch, but we can't see. 
The fact is so unusual that it strikes us with terror. But uh, take a piece of pure glass. It is tangible and transparent. A certain chemical coarseness is all that prevents it being so entirely transparent as to be totally invisible. It is not theoretically impossible, mind you, to make a glass which shall not reflect a single ray of light. And we don't see the air, and yet we feel it. That's all very well, Hammond, but these are inanimate substances. Glass doesn't breathe, air doesn't breathe. This thing has a heart that palpitates, a will that moves it, lungs that inspire and respire. Yes, but you forget the phenomena of which we have so often heard of late. At the meetings called spirit circles, invisible hands have been thrust into the hands of those persons round the table. Warm, fleshy hands that seem to pulsate with mortal life. What? Do you think then that this thing... I don't know what it is. But please the gods, I will, with your assistance, thoroughly investigate it. This we did. The next day we decided to take a cast of the creature. This would give us a solid figure and satisfy all our wishes. First we administered chloroform to stop its activity. In three minutes we were enabled to remove the fetters from the creature's body, and the plaster of Paris was applied. In five minutes we had a mold, and before evening a round facsimile of the mystery. It was shaped like a man, distorted, uncouth, and horrible, but still a man. It was small, not over four feet and some inches in height, and its limbs revealed a muscular development that was unparalleled. Its face surpassed in hideousness anything I had ever seen. It was the physiognomy of what I should fancy a ghoul might have. It looked as if it were capable of feeding on human flesh. Having satisfied our curiosity and bound everyone in the house to secrecy, it became a question what was to be done with our enigma. It was impossible that such an awful being should be let loose upon the world. I confess that I would have gladly voted for the creature's destruction, but who would shoulder the responsibility? The most singular part of the affair was that we were entirely ignorant of what the creature habitually fed on. Everything in the way of nutriment that we could think of was placed before it, but was never touched. It was awful to stand by day after day and see the clothes toss and hear the hard breathing and know that it was starving. Ten, twelve days, two weeks passed, and it still lived. The pulsations of the heart, however, were daily growing fainter and had now nearly ceased. It was evident that the creature was dying for want of sustenance. While this terrible life struggle was going on, I, I felt miserable. I couldn't sleep. Horrible as the creature was, it was pitiful to think of the pangs it was suffering. At last, it died. Hammond and I found it cold and stiff one morning in the bed. We buried it in the garden. It was a strange funeral, the dropping of that viewless corpse into the damp hole. The cast of its form I gave to a museum on 10th Street in New York. As I am on the eve of a long journey from which I may never return, I have drawn up this narrative of an event the most singular that has ever come to my knowledge. <laughs>